Welcome to the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast, Season 3, Episode 8. This is the final episode of Season 3. Evidence-Based Hair is a podcast produced for practitioners around the world who care for patients with hair loss. For those who simply find the topic of hair loss as intriguing and fascinating as I do, this podcast will also be of interest. Each week, I'll review a handful of research studies that are changing how we think about hair loss. I'll introduce them to you, I'll help you digest them, and I'll give you my thoughts on how a given study just might influence how we diagnose and treat hair loss. These are studies in androgenetic hair loss, alopecia areata, telogen effluvium, traction alopecia, trichotillomania, scarring, and non-scarring alopecia. Evidence-Based Hair is a podcast produced by the Donovan Hair Academy. It was created for new practitioners as well as the seasoned practitioner. It was created for educational purposes and shouldn't be considered a substitute for medical advice. The first Monday of each month is dedicated to topics related to androgenetic hair loss and alopecia areata, and that's where we will turn to today. I'll be reviewing six fascinating studies from the last few months. We'll begin by talking about the role of oral and systemic steroids in the so-called JAK inhibitor era. I was fascinated by the title of an article questioning whether we need steroids in the era of JAK inhibitors. I was encouraged that the conclusion of the article was that indeed we do. We have to keep in mind that JAK inhibitors are certainly wonderful treatments for alopecia areata, but they don't help everyone. And in fact, only a third of patients with advanced alopecia areata are helped with the FDA-approved drug baricitinib. So we still have a long way to go. Reason to celebrate, but we still have a long way to go in treating alopecia areata. Then we'll move on to a study of periodontitis, and the risk of alopecia areata. Periodontitis is a gum disease. One stage further along in periodontal gum disease progression than gingivitis. We'll take a look at a very interesting study highlighting an association between periodontitis and alopecia areata. Then we'll look at a study of microneedling with triamcinolone and alopecia areata. This was a really interesting study. When the pandemic began... I heard of a lot of patients asking me if it's okay to put steroids on their scalp and microneedle it at home because of the lockdown, they can't go in to get their steroid injections. And my feeling was, wow, I I don't know whether that's efficacious, um, how often we should do that. That's certainly interesting. It makes some sense. Then the pandemic lockdowns ended and I never did think further about the role of microneedling of steroids with alopecia areata. Well, a nice study does look at this issue of microneedling with triamcinolone acetonide, comparing injections to simply placing it on the scalp and microneedling it. We'll take a look at this very interesting study. Then we'll move on to three studies in androgenetic hair loss. A very nice study in transgender men and women addressing whether or not hair loss occurs from the hormonal treatments that patients go on, especially in transgender men who are given hormones, especially testosterone, to induce virilization. Are some of these individuals experiencing hair loss? Well, a very nice study asks and answers this very question, and we'll take a look at it. And the answer is yes, that testosterone administration does cause hair loss. And we'll take a look at the differences in transgender men and transgender women. Then we'll take a look at microneedling and androgenetic alopecia, a nice study showing a benefit of microneedling with 1.5 millimeter microneedles. And then finally, a very, very nice study looking at the differences between Using minoxidil compared to minoxidil with microneedling compared to minoxidil and spironolactone in the treatment of androgenetic hair loss in women. A very nice study which puts microneedling with minoxidil at the top of the list and superior to microneedling and oral spironolactone. Not a lot ahead, but a bit ahead nevertheless, and oral spironolactone had a lot more side effects in that study. So we'll take a look at this very, very nice study. 
The references for all of these studies that I'll review today are in the show notes that accompany the episode. So let's begin then by a very nice study in the International Journal of Dermatology asking, are systemic and topical corticosteroids still useful in this era of JAK inhibitors? So I really liked this study because it's a nice reminder that JAK inhibitors don't always grow hair completely. And sometimes they don't suppress alopecia areata completely, even if they do regrow it in the first place. And we can expect patients to have flares. And what do we do when patients have flares? Meaning they regrew their hair and now they're losing it again. Do we increase the dose of the JAK inhibitor? Well, no. That's not necessarily a good idea. It increases the, infa- the side effects of infection, possibility of zoster, possibility of blood clots, possibility of increased cholesterol, creatine kinase, blood test abnormalities. So what do we do? Well, if a patient is on a JAK inhibitor and they flare, you can introduce topical corticosteroids, oral corticosteroids. As this study points out, we certainly have to be careful with oral steroids, given the added effect of immunosuppression, we can add minoxidil. We can add um, other treatments that can be helpful to alopecia areata. And so let's take a look at this study, which suggests to us that corticosteroids still have a role in alopecia areata in this JAK inhibitor era. I don't think the term JAK inhibitor era is necessarily the right term to be using. I think It is an incredible milestone in the treatment of alopecia areata, but I think that it is a stepping stone en route to uh, additional treatments. And we don't know how long this type of therapy will be with us in alopecia areata and what modifications will be made to this type of therapy and what additional JAK inhibitors come along after us. But I don't think in 15 years, we'll be using some of these JAK inhibitors that we have today in the treatment of alopecia areata. I think they'll either be better JAK inhibitors or better therapies. But it is a landmark breakthrough that we have today. But let's begin then by talking about this 35-year-old male with alopecia areata and atopic dermatitis. His atopic dermatitis had been present for 10 years. His alopecia areata had been present for three years. And he had complete loss of scalp, eyebrow, eyelash, hair. And his SALT score was 100. Remember, a SALT score of 100 means total scalp hair loss. A SALT score of 0 means complete regrowth. So he was started on dupilumab. Dupilumab is approved for uh, atopic dermatitis. And he had what many patients have, and that is an eczema flare after his 24-week period of being on dupilumab. And the hope was that he would be put on dupilumab and his atopic dermatitis would respond, his eczema would respond, and his alopecia areata would respond. We know that dupilumab is a treatment for atopic dermatitis, but it's also a treatment for alopecia areata. But because his eczema flared, he was stopped, uh, the dupilumab, and he was put on the JAK inhibitor, upadacitinib, and that was 15 milligrams twice daily. He had a good response to his atopic dermatitis as well as his alopecia areata after four months. But his alopecia areata flared again despite the upadacitinib. And so he was treated with triamcinolone, 40 milligrams once weekly for four weeks, as well as topical clobetazole and topical minoxidil. And after four weeks, hair growth was noted, and he had been in remission now for his alopecia areata for a period of six months months, and he has continued upadacitinib. So I really like this study. That The title certainly caught my attention. Is there a role for corticosteroids in the JAK inhibitor era? And my feeling when I read that title is, of course, there's a, a role for corticosteroids in the JAK inhibitor era without topical steroids and steroid injections. It would be difficult to manage all of the patients with alopecia areata I see. And I pulled out this paper and I was, of course, glad to see that their conclusion was absolutely there's a role, but there's a couple of key points here that are really important for us all to reflect on. First, keep in mind that not all patients respond to JAK inhibitors. How many patients with advanced alopecia areata respond to baricitinib with very, very nice results? 25%. 
how many patients with advanced alopecia areata respond with good results? 30%, 33%. So we have to keep in mind that JAK inhibitors are extremely valuable for advanced alopecia areata. They're one of the most important tools we have in our toolbox, but not all patients respond. So I think we should certainly use 2022 to celebrate this breakthrough of FDA approval for baricitinib, but I think that we have to remember that we've got a long way to go. And when new JAK inhibitors come out, I'm going to be very excited. But right now, we're at a, we're at a, you know, a, about a quarter of patients having outstanding results and a third of patients having pretty good results with advanced alopecia areata. So not everybody responds to JAK inhibitors, so we need other tools in our toolbox. One of those tools is corticosteroids, especially topical steroids and steroid injections. So if a patient doesn't respond well, it might be that we stop it and use another treatment instead of a JAK inhibitor, or we use another treatment with a JAK inhibitor. But once we use a JAK inhibitor and a good response occurs, we'll often continue the JAK inhibitor and use another treatment if a flare occurs. And in this case, corticosteroids can be used. When we're using topical treatments with JAK inhibitors, we have to remember it has a lot better safety than when we use oral treatments that carry the risk of further immunosuppression. And in fact, various health regulatory bodies have been pretty straightforward by saying, listen, if you're going to use other immunosuppressants with JAK inhibitors, you've got to be really careful. And I think if you're going to use oral steroids with JAK inhibitors, if you're going to use other biologic with JAK inhibitors, you really got to know what you're doing and you really got to have some, um, you know, very advanced training in the use of these medications. We increase the risk of immunosuppression. We increase the risk of side effects. And so uh, I'm not a great fan of combining um, systemic medications with JAK inhibitors if I don't have to, at least now, because there's not a lot of data to back us up, and it certainly isn't the standard of care. Do keep in mind that even when a patient responds well to JAK inhibitors, flares can occur. So when a patient comes back to see me, they've been put on tofacitinib, they've been put on baricitinib, they come back 24 weeks later, they come in the office, you can tell that We've regrown a whole lot of hair. You can just tell by the smile on the face. You can tell by the way the patient walks, the patient, the way the patient holds their head. The thing you have to always be humble to is that patient can go on to lose hair again. So I think we need to celebrate when a patient comes back and they used to have almost total hair loss and now they're sprouting hair all over. We have to celebrate. Absolutely. But we have to be humble to the fact that a patch could occur in the future. Further hair loss could occur in the future. Alopecia areata can flare. So when a patient says to you, Doc, do you think I'm out of the woods? Do you think that this is it? I've got the drug forever? Hard to say. Some patients do flare. Fortunately, in many cases, we can still get it back with topical steroids, steroid injections. When you see a patient back and they're flaring on a JAK inhibitor, they were doing so well and now they're flaring. Ten years ago, not ten, maybe five, we would increase the dose of JAK, of JAK inhibitors. If a patient was doing well on tofacitinib 5 BID, 5 milligrams BID, we'd go up to 15, we'd go up to 20. Some of my colleagues went up to 25. We know now that there's a dose-dependent side effect response with JAK inhibitors. So if you go up on the dose of JAK inhibitors, the FDA tells us you can expect an increase in the risk of blood clots. That's why we don't use 10 milligrams of tofacitinib BID anymore. We stop at 5 milligrams BID. You can expect an increase in cholesterol if you're going to go up on your dose of JAK inhibitors. You can expect an increase in creatinine, chance of zoster infections, chance of um, non-melanoma skin cancer down the road. So we have to be careful about going up on a JAK inhibitor. So if a patient is flaring with their alopecia areata, the answer may not be to go up on the JAK inhibitor. The answer is to look in the toolbox, open it right up, and say, what else is in there? What else can I use? And this author suggests topical steroids, minoxidil, and steroids as well. So they used intramuscular triamcinolone. 
And their point is that corticosteroids are still in the toolbox in the JAK inhibitor era. And so the way I view it is that when alopecia areata increases in activity and we get hair loss, we bring on board a treatment to suppress that activity. And then if we are maintaining low activity, we continue the treatment. If we continue at low activity for long enough, we're talking nine months, a year, two years, maybe, just maybe, we can think about reducing the dose of the immunosuppressant. We have to be careful. We know that that doesn't always work. And in fact, in many cases, you get rebound and you get sometimes worse hair loss than you started with. So you have to be very careful about reducing the dose of an immunosuppressant, especially JAK inhibitors. But if you get flares, you can introduce corticosteroids. If you get a patch or two of alopecia areata, you can get the patient to consider corticosteroid injections or topical steroids or minoxidil. So we move on now to a very nice study from Korea addressing the relationship between periodontitis, this periodontal gum disease, and the risk of alopecia areata. I really like this study. It was published in the Journal of the European Academy of Dermatology and Venereology, November. Have you heard about all of the interesting cases over the last several years of patients that have a gum abscess or a tooth infection or a, some sort of gum issue and they develop alopecia areata and someone says, I think there's an association between gum issues, teeth issues, and alopecia areata. And when you hear that, they're often case reports or anecdotal and you feel, I don't know. I don't know what to think. It seems interesting. They have their gum disease. They get alopecia areata. They treat their gum disease. Their alopecia areata sometimes improves. But this study looks at it on, on a bigger level. So let's take a look at it. Periodontitis is a gum disease. It starts with inflammation in the gingiva. And so gingivitis is the first step en route to periodontitis. But after gingivitis, if the gingivitis isn't treated, the inflammation spreads deeper below the gums, along the roots of the teeth. And the result is permanent damage to the tissues of the periodontal ligament. And teeth can be lost, gums recess, teeth become longer. And so we have the spectrum from healthy gums to gingivitis. The gingivitis isn't addressed, you get periodontitis. If the periodontitis isn't addressed, you get loss of teeth. So gingivitis is inflammation limited to the gum line. 50% of the world, the Western world especially, has gingivitis. And periodontitis is the next step if gingivitis isn't addressed associated with loss of the jawbone, the periodontal ligament, and the root cementum. So patients with gingivitis can develop periodontitis if they don't treat their gingivitis. And certainly periodontitis is a more serious form. Patients might not have any symptoms. They might go to the dentist and the dentist says, you know, your gums are receding. Your gums used to cover your teeth and your teeth used to be small. Now your gums are receding and your teeth are really long. Have you noticed how long your teeth are? That may be periodontitis. So patients may have no symptoms, but they may have puffy gums, swollen gums, bleeding gums, symptoms that we think about with gingivitis. They may have bad breath. Receding gums is a, is a feature of this periodontitis, giving longer teeth, and they may have painful chewing. So periodontitis is influenced by oral hygiene and good brushing of the teeth. So if you stop gingivitis, you can stop the progression to periodontitis. But there's other risk factors for periodontitis, including smoking, genetics, age, diet, diabetes, and stress. And it's currently thought that periodontitis may have features of an autoimmune disease. And in fact, several studies have suggested that the inflammatory response is very much what we see in autoimmune diseases. The bacteria in plaque can induce antibody formation, and you can get autoreactive T cells, natural killer cells, autoantibodies. And so there's thought to be very strong genetic factors in periodontal disease. And in fact, when I take a history of a patient with hair loss, there are several features in the history that make me feel, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder if my patient sitting in front of me could have an autoimmune scalp disease. 
One is if they have a history of various autoimmune diseases, but especially autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, like periodontitis, like uh, inflammatory bowel disease, like multiple sclerosis, like um, psoriasis. These all heighten my awareness that, hmm, I'm obviously going to do just as good of a job looking at the scalp and taking a history as I would have otherwise, but there are certain factors that really cause me to sit up and pay attention. And over the last few years, periodontitis is one of them that causes me to sit up. Maybe we're more aware of periodontitis. I don't know. Maybe as one ages, more people around you have periodontitis. But periodontitis is thought to be autoimmune in nature at least in some studies, and patients with periodontitis have an increased risk of lupus, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis. What about alopecia areata? Well, there's been these sporadic reports in the literature about the association between dental disease and alopecia areata, so these authors from Korea became very interested in addressing the relationship between periodontitis and alopecia areata. So they used the National Health Insurance Service Claims Database, a huge database of medical information, to compare 68,000 patients with periodontitis to 68,000 patients without periodontitis. And they asked the question, how common is alopecia areata in this group? Well, there was a statistically higher proportion of patients developing alopecia areata in the periodontitis group, 36% increased risk, hazard ratio 1.36. And that was true for patchy alopecia areata, true for alopecia totalis and universalis. Children and young adults with periodontitis had an even higher risk of alopecia areata, hazard ratios of 2.01, 2.06. And the authors showed that patients with periodontitis had an increased risk not only for alopecia areata, but lupus, hazard ratio 2.97, rheumatoid arthritis, hazard ratio 1.18, and atopic dermatitis, 1.22. So, a really nice study showing this association between periodontitis and alopecia areata. And patients with periodontitis may be at risk for alopecia areata. The mechanism is not known. Not all patients with periodontitis go on to develop alopecia areata, of course, but it's a risk. And it may be that when a patient has periodontitis, it's telling us, you have a predisposition to autoimmune disease. You have a predisposition to develop alopecia areata, systemic lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, atopic dermatitis. You may never develop it, but you have this risk of autoimmune disease. So in our third study of alopecia areata this week, we look at a very nice study comparing injections with triamcinolone acetonide compared to microneedling of the triamcinolone acetonide, published in the September-October issue of the International Journal of Trichology. I really like this study. When the COVID lockdowns occurred in the spring of 2020, many, many patients would contact our office and ask, I can't get in to see my dermatologist to do steroid injections, but I've been told to buy a microneedling device, put my topical steroid on my scalp, and microneedle it. It'll be good good enough. It'll be just as good as steroid injections. And so my thought at that time was, sure, it's a great idea. How often do we do the microneedling? How often should we put on the steroid on the scalp? What steroid should we use? Should we use clobetazole, which we usually use? If we microneedle clobetazole, does it become even stronger? And do we get atrophy of the scalp? Do we get stria? Do we get acne? Do we get uh, immunosuppression? Do we get an increased risk of systemic issues? Should we be using beta-methasone? What should we be using? What is with this microneedling of steroids? And then the lockdowns ended quite quickly, and I never thought about it much more, and I never really came to know if any of this microneedling business helped any of these people that contacted us. And so when I saw this study in the September-October issue of the International Journal of Dermatology looking at this question, my thought was, this is great. It was microneedling done in the office, not microneedling done at home, but nevertheless, it addressed this very important question. And so there were two groups. Patients in group one 
underwent microneedling with a 1.5 millimeter microneedle with topical application of triamcinolone acetonide before the derma rolling and after the derma rolling. So the 10 milligram per mil triamcinolone was taken out of the bottle and dripped on the scalp. Normally that's taken out of the bottle in a syringe and put into the scalp. But here that same triamcinolone acetonide is dripped on the scalp before microneedling and after microneedling. And then derma rolling was done diagonally, vertically, horizontally, four to five times in each direction. So group one had the steroid dripped on the scalp. Group two had the steroid injected into the scalp. 10 milligram per mil was used. Remember, these steroids usually come to us in 10 milligrams per mil or 40 milligrams per mil. This was 10 milligrams per mil. And the total volume was 0.1 milliliters for every square centimeter of area. And patients had three sessions three weeks apart. The mean age of disease onset in all patients in group one and group two was the same. Disease duration was similar in both groups. Mean duration of about 13 weeks. And the mean area of the lesions at week one was 13 square centimeters in group one and 10 square centimeters in group two. So that's important. These are focal patches of alopecia areata. So a five centimeter patch by a two centimeter patch is 10 square centimeters. So this is a microneedling study in more localized alopecia areata. It's not alopecia multilocularis. It's not a study of alopecia totalis. But we'll come to that in a minute. So we have these two groups, one getting microneedling into the scalp, uh, one getting microneedling on the scalp, one getting steroid injections as we do traditionally. 0.1 mils per centimeter squared using a 10 milligram per mil triamcinolone acetonide solution. Group one had a regrowth of 66% by week nine. Group two, had regrowth of 69% at week 9. No statistically significant difference between those two groups. So, a really nice study suggesting to us that, gee, this mechanism of microneedling may be reasonable and has similar results in small patches of alopecia areata compared to steroid injections. Now, you might ask yourself, well, these are pretty small patches, 10 square centimeters. You know, a three centimeter by three centimeter patch is almost 10 square centimeters. These are small. But a really important study to know about is the study from 2014, which looked at microneedling with triamcinolone in this same manner, published in the Journal of Cutaneous and Aesthetic Surgery, with larger areas of hair loss. So, the authors in 2014 looked at microneedling with topical application of triamcinolone. They described two patients who had no improvement with steroid injections, no improvement with topical steroid creams, no improvement with minoxidil. And so they went on to pursue a treatment protocol with microneedling a 1.5 millimeter microneedling device, which was a derma roller. So not a derma stamp, not a derma pen, but a derma roller with 192 needles, 1.5 millimeters in length, followed by the topical ap application of triamcinolone acetonide. Again, the bottle of 10 milligrams per mil was brought out and the triamcinolone was applied before the derma rolling and after the derma rolling. The scalp was cleaned first, the derma roller was moved horizontally, vertically, diagonally, four to five times in each direction to create pinpoint bleeding, and then the triamcinolone was applied again. No anesthesia was needed in this 2014 protocol. Painless, as the author describes, three sessions every three weeks. So this is free online. Title, alopecia areata, dash, successful outcome with microneedling and triamcinolone acetonide, Journal of Cutaneous and Aesthetic Surgery 2014, patient with pretty advanced alopecia areata, with many patches covering maybe 40% of the scalp, 50% of the scalp, underwent this microneedling protocol and had very nice, complete regrowth of hair with 
1.5 millimeters of microneedling with triamcinolone put on the scalp. So this data is super interesting. Both the 2014 data and this new study suggests that microneedling with triamcinolone is a potentially helpful way of treating alopecia areata, especially more localized forms. I haven't done this protocol. Certainly I've done microneedling, but I haven't done this particular protocol. It's interesting that the authors describe this as being not only effective, but very painless for these patients. They're getting pinpoint bleeding four to five times in each direction, vertical, one, two, three, four, five, horizontal, one, two, three, four, five, and diagonal, one, two, three, four, five. That's how you move your derma roller. There's 192 little needle derma roller. You apply the triamcinolone before, you apply the triamcinolone after the microneedling. So it's very interesting. One certainly wonders with this study if we can really adopt any at-home protocols for administration of steroids. The answer is we probably can, and this good study is needed. Of course, it needs to be done under supervision. You know, remember years ago when we started difenciprone treatment for alopecia areata? Um, we had a huge backlog of patients, huge wait list. And I think the clinic actually even closed because we couldn't take any more patients. And the question we started to have is, can patients do this at home? Can we train spouses to do this? Can we train parents to do this for apply the DPCP for their children? DPCP or difenciprone is a completely different treatment. But my point is, is that at first we said, no, it's not safe. It's not safe to be having patients be doing this at home. What happens if they drip the DPCP all over the place? What happens if someone does it wrong? What happens if someone gets a side effect? And then some good studies started coming out suggesting that at-home use is just as effective. And then institutions like, um, I think it was the Cleveland Clinic and other institutions started saying, we have patients doing it at home. And then studies started coming out in the medical literature showing pretty good safety of at-home use. And so some of these treatments like microneedling are being done at home. And it is indeed possible that microneedling with steroids can be done at home. I think the question is what steroid, what strength, what frequency, what depth of needle. So we have more work to do. But these are really important studies of the good safety, good efficacy of this protocol. So we move on now to studies of androgenetic hair loss. And I'd like to review three studies with you in the area of, micro of androgenetic hair loss. We'll come to two studies of microneedling in androgenetic hair loss in just a minute. But we'll look at first a study looking at the development of hair loss in gender-affirming hormone treatment in transgender men and women. So the title of this study is Effects of Hormonal Treatment on Dermatological Outcome in Transgender People, a Multicentric Perspective Study. So 1.6 million people in the U.S. identify as transgender. Studies have suggested that about 1% of adults in North Carolina, the state of North Carolina in the United States, identify as transgender. It differs in other states, 0.2% in Missouri. But a significant proportion and an increasing proportion of youth identify as transgender. And I think that's an important message today, is that it's an increasing proportion of our young people. And about 18% of individuals who identify as transgender are youth. And in New York... Some studies have suggested that 3% of youth identify as transgender. So gender-affirming hormonal treatments is usually the first medical intervention requested by transgender people in order to align their body with their perceived gender. So many a times, medical hormonal treatments are used ahead of any surgical interventions. So the medical interventions generally involve testosterone for transgender men, or AFAB, assigned female at birth, trans people. And that's the terminology that the authors have used in this paper. So I will use the terminology that the authors used. I appreciate that there is some sensitivity and differences in the way that um, transgender individuals wish to um, be identified, but I'll use the terminology in the paper. So testosterone is used for transgender men, AFAB, assigned females at birth, and Estrogens with antiandrogens are used for transgender females. 
uh, assigned males at birth, transgender women. But hair loss is often a concern in this gender-affirming hormonal treatment, given that assigned females at birth, transgender men, who are given androgens to obtain virilization, may experience hair loss from the androgens. So in many cases, androgenetic hair loss is driven by androgens. So giving androgens to transgender men can cause hair loss in many cases. This study looked at this in more depth. It was a multicenter study looking at the dermatologic changes in transgender people after gender-affirming hormonal treatment. So assigned female at birth people, transgender men, receive testosterone, generally intramuscular injections of testosterone or testosterone gel, transdermal gel. Trans AMAB people, trans females, obtained estrogens as well as antiandrogens to obtain feminization and demasculinization. And in this study, it was usually ciprodone acetate combined with estradiol valerate or estradiol patches or estradiol gel. There were 193 trans women, 291 trans men in the study that looked at various dermatologic parameters at baseline at 6 months and 12 months. They looked at hair loss, acne, and increased hair using the Ferriman galloway score. I'm going to focus here on the hair loss and the hair loss was assessed by the Hamilton Norwood scale. In AFAB people, trans men, the Hamilton Norwood scale increased over 12 months from 1.07 to 1.21. It increased a little bit in the first six months, but it was the next six months where hair loss really increased more. Testosterone levels rose from 1.2 to 22 nanomoles per liter, not surprisingly, with the administration of testosterone. There was also an increase in acne and hair on the body with testosterone. In assigned males at birth, transgender women, the Hamilton-Norwood scale decreased from 2 to 1.76 with the antiandrogen ciprodone acetate and the estradiol, but this change wasn't thought to be statistically significant. The testosterone levels decreased from 19 to 0.7 nanomoles per liter, and estradiol increased from 89 to 200 picomoles per liter. So an interesting study which highlights a worsening of androgenetic hair loss in AFAB people, transgender men, over 12 months of observation. Not a huge change, but not a long period of observation. So I think this is really important. We need to counsel our transgender patients on what to expect with gender-affirming hormonal treatments. And I see many patients that identify as transgender and are undergoing medical intervention. And I think it's really important to understand this, that the administration of testosterone in many patients can lead to hair loss, regardless of the, the family history. Certainly the family history is really relevant. So a transgender male with father with hair loss, mother with hair loss, grandfather with advanced hair loss, probably increases the risk of androgenetic hair loss, yes, but even without a history, that still can occur. So we need to counsel patients. And even if you reach the one-year time point and you find, I've been on this hormonal treatment and I haven't really lost much hair, that's great. But hair loss can still occur year two, three, four, five, six. Maybe your genetics that are driving androgenetic hair loss are going to kick in at 36 or 42. And so when they see testosterone on board at 22, that doesn't cause hair loss. The genes driving the hair loss are ready to go in 10 years from now. So you don't get much hair loss if you undergo gender-affirming hormonal treatment at 23, 25, 27, 31. But then now at 32, there's this dramatic change when the testosterone therapy is still on board. So we have to understand these, these studies that... Hair loss can occur more common in transgender males than transgender women, but it still can occur in both. And in my clinic, topical antiandrogens are very helpful for transgender men, along with topical and oral minoxidil uh, for both transgender men and transgender women. 
But oral minoxidil and topical minoxidil are playing a really, really important role in the management of hair loss in individuals that identify as transgender. So a nice study next looking at microneedling with minoxidil solution in androgenetic hair loss. So microneedling continues to be very popular. Patients are buying microneedles on the internet. They're using it at home. They're making their scalps bleed. They're doing it weekly, every two weeks, twice a week. No one knows what to do. People are using different devices, different techniques, different protocols. And so we've got a whole lot of red scalps out there. And is it helping? Probably some of them are helping. Some of them are getting more hair loss. Some of them are getting more hair shedding. Some of them are getting a telogen effluvium. So it's a frustrating world out there of microneedling. What technique do we use? What device do we use? What depth do we use? One study comes out showing 0.6 millimeter microneedles are better than 1.2 millimeter microneedles. That changes the entire field. What are we doing with these 1.5 micromillimeter microneedles? Next study comes out showing that a 1.5 is the one we should use, and everybody switch backs to a 1.5. So it's a confusing world out there. And the first question is, why does it work? Does it work? Well, studies in animal models and some clinical data suggest that microneedling probably promotes the Wnt beta catenin or catenin, depending on how you want to pronounce it, signaling pathway. And the Wnt pathway is key for stem cell activation and proliferation. There's theories that microneedling helps angiogenesis. There's theories it creates these little micropores in the epidermis and drugs get in better. So microneedling is used to get minoxidil into the scalp more effectively. It's used to get lots of drugs into the, into the skin. And there's theories that microneedling enhances minoxidil sulfotransferase enzymes in the skin. And so when you put minoxidil on the scalp, it works all that much better because the sulfotransferase enzymes are upregulated. So all these different mechanisms. But if you're going to talk about microneedling in androgenetic hair loss, you have to know about the landmark 2013 study by Durat and colleagues. And if you don't know the Durat and colleagues study of 2013, you should because it's fundamental to any discussion of microneedling. And so Durat enrolled 100 patients with androgenetic hair loss and divided them into two groups. First group, which was 50 patients, had microneedling with 1.5 millimeter microneedles and they had twice daily application of minoxidil lotion. The second group, 44 patients, was given only 5% minoxidil. That was the minoxidil only group. So one group doing minoxidil with microneedling, one group doing minoxidil alone, and they assessed the responses on a seven point scale. With plus three being an outstanding result, plus two being good result, plus one being yeah, some improvement, zero being not really anything. Minus one being a negative response, minus two and three being significantly worsening of hair loss. So in the Durat 2013 study, the mean change in hair counts at week 12 was significantly greater for the minoxidil microneedling group compared to the minoxidil only group. 91 versus 22 hairs. And investigators felt that 40% of patients in the combo group had good results, plus two and plus three responses, compared to none receiving minoxidil only. Patients themselves thought there was some pretty good results with the combo treatment. 82% of patients felt that they had 50% or more improvement in the minoxidil microneedling group compared to just 4.5% in the minoxidil only group. So the Durat study is a key study suggesting that, hey, this microneedling approach is pretty reasonable. Now we have a study, Lingling Ling and colleagues, in the Journal of Cosmetic Dermatology in July, looking at microneedling. It's a study from China which set out to evaluate the benefits of microneedling in 18 patients. 10 females, 8 males. Durat was a study of uh, males. And here we have a study of 10 females, 8 males, 18 in total. Mean age was 37. Most were Hamilton Norwood 2-3 for the male group and Ludwig 1 for the female group. So the microneedling procedure was very typical, similar to the Durat study. A 1.5 millimeter device rolled longitudinally, vertically, diagonally to get pinpoint bleeding. 5% minoxidil was used after the microneedling, and it was rubbed in for three minutes. And patients 
were getting this weekly for six sessions, and they applied minoxidil twice daily at home. They used the scoring system used by Durat, seven-point system, plus three being outstanding, plus two being pretty good, plus one being somewhat good, zero being nothing. All patients in this study benefited from microneedling. 61% had mild improvement when physicians were asked to rate the improvement. 33% had moderate and 5.5% had really significant improvement. When patients evaluated their responses, 39% said it was mild improvement, 55.5% said moderate, and 5% said obvious and 50% of patients themselves were moderately or greatly satisfied with the treatment. So it lacks a comparative group in this Ling Lang study, but it's very similar to the Durat study. 40 to 50% of patients that do this microneedling technique with minoxidil and apply minoxidil at home are pretty satisfied with their outcomes. So now we come to a really wonderful study, our last study of Season 3, Episode 8, the last study of this year. And that's Liang and colleagues, published in Frontiers in Medicine, titled Efficacy and Safety of 5% Minoxidil Alone, Minoxidil Plus Oral Spironolactone, and Minoxidil Plus Microneedling on Female Pattern Hair Loss a prospective single-center parallel group evaluated blind randomized trial. Why such a long title? Because it was a pretty involved study, and I really like this study. If you want to see how good studies are designed and the different parameters which are useful to study, pull up Liang and colleagues, Frontiers in Medicine, July 2022. So the author set out to determine whether adding microneedling to a topical minoxidil plan or adding spironolactone to a topical minoxidil plan works better than topical minoxidil alone. So they designed a prospective, single-center, parallel group, evaluator-blind, randomized controlled trial with 120 women with female pattern hair loss. Patients were assigned to three groups. Minoxidil alone, once daily. Minoxidil alone plus spironolactone, 80 to 100 milligrams. Remember, these are all females in this study. Or minoxidil with microneedling. Microneedling every two weeks for 12 sessions. And so the authors evaluated several parameters at baseline and at week 24, including hair density and hair diameter by dermoscopy, scalp tissue structures by ultrasound, physician global assessments using that famous seven-point scale as well as the Sinclair stage of hair loss, one, two, three, four, five, Patients' evaluation of how well they think they're doing, a patient questionnaire on quality of life, and Sinclair hair shedding score, and side effects. So the criteria for participation in the trial was females age 18 to 45 with normal hormone levels and a diagnosis of female pattern hair loss of Sinclair class 2 or 3. So fairly early stage female pattern hair loss. What was the microneedling protocol? Well, patients washed their hair before treatment. Alcohol cotton balls were applied to clean the scalp. Minoxidil was applied topically. A microneedling device to a depth of 0.7 to 1 millimeters was applied. Punctate hemorrhage was the endpoint. And patients were told not to wash their hair for 8 hours or use minoxidil for 24 hours. So that's how the microneedling with minoxidil was done in those who got microneedling. So there was 115 participants in total, 5 dropped out, 38 in the minoxidil-only group, 37 in the minoxidil with spironolactone oral group, and 40 in the topical minoxidil and microneedling group. Mean age of patients was 31, similar in all three groups. Patients had hair loss 4.5 to 6 years, similar in all three groups. In fact, there was no difference in baseline characteristics in all three groups. What were the results? Well, at week 24, hair density increased the most in the minoxidil microneedling group. It increased the least in the minoxidil only group. And minoxidil with oral spironolactone was second place. There was a change in 9.95 hairs in the minoxidil only group, 17 hairs in the minoxidil and spiral group, 30 hairs in the minoxidil microneedling group. And these were all statistically significant. 
hair shaft diameter increased in all groups. And there was no significant difference in these three groups in the hair shaft diameter. Diameter increased by about 15 micrometers. In terms of physician assessments of photographs, there was improvements in all three groups. 50% in minoxidil group were thought to have an improvement when evaluators looked at photographs. This was 86% of patients had an improvement in the minoxidil spiral group when photographs were examined by investigators, but it was 95% of patients having an improvement in the minoxidil microneedling group. So no patient in the minoxidil spiral group or the minoxidil microneedling group had worsening, but 5% in the minoxidil only group had a worsening of hair loss. What about the Sinclair score? Well, the Sinclair score improved the most in the minoxidil microneedling group. The second place winner was minoxidil spironolactone, and the least improvement was the minoxidil only group. And hair shedding and quality of life improved in all groups. Scalp itching was the most common side effect. This was topical minoxidil liquid, of course, not foam. The minoxidil spiral group, the oral spironolactone, 80 to 100 milligrams, had the most side effects. 15%, 15 patients had menstrual disorders, and that's 15 out of about 40. One patient had hyperkalemia, one patient had edema, and irregular periods was the most common side effect. There was one infection short-term in the minoxidil microneedling group, and it didn't affect the ongoing treatment plan or the protocol. So a really nice study suggesting the potential superiority of minoxidil and microneedling in the treatment of androgenetic hair loss. Side effects are less common for minoxidil and microneedling than minoxidil spironolactone. And one wonders, of course, whether a combo of all three of these, minoxidil topically with microneedling, with oral spironolactone, would be even more superior. So that concludes Season 3, Episode 8. That concludes this year. We've reviewed six studies this week, one looking at the role of steroids in the JAK inhibitor era. JAK inhibitors are incredible treatments, the most effective treatments for advanced alopecia areata, but they don't help everyone. We need more tools in our toolbox. So don't forget, topical, injectable, and sometimes oral steroids in the treatment of alopecia areata. There's a risk of alopecia areata in patients with periodontitis. Study from Korea suggests 36, 37% increased risk. We looked at a very nice study looking at a microneedling protocol with topical steroids. I think this will be an important study to look at and an important protocol for the future. We looked at hair loss in gender-affirming hormonal treatment and a significant proportion of trans men having hair loss starts around six months, then increases towards 12 months. That's when the study ended. Don't forget many trans men can go on to have even further loss in year two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Topical antiandrogens, oral minoxidil, topical minoxidil, laser, PRP, these are all options, as well as hair transplants. We looked at a very nice study of microneedling and androgenetic hair loss, and a, another very nice study showing superiority of microneedling with uh, minoxidil compared to minoxidil and spironolactone in androgenetic hair loss in women. So that brings us to the end of Season 3, Episode 8. I hope you'll join me next week, Wednesday, December 14th, at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's where we review the top 20 studies of the year gone by. 20 absolutely incredible studies that change what we do in the clinic, change how we think, change how we care about patients with hair loss. It's always a wonderful event that really honors and celebrates some wonderful research, some carefully designed studies with some good conclusions that really push this field forward for the good of everybody. Thanks for joining me today. Hope to see you next week and hope to see you when we're back for season four in February. Whole new season starts in the year 2023. I hope you'll join me then. But I do want to thank you for joining me this year for our very first year of the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast. I am grateful for all the wonderful comments that have come our way and how the episodes are helping people and helping people care for patients with hair loss. That was the intention. And so I'm glad that it's having some role in that regard. Send us your comments. I look forward to receiving them. I look forward to seeing you again for another episode of the Evidence-Based Hair Podcast.